Good morning. It's good to see everyone here today in Maryville. Good morning to everybody in Knoxville that uh, made it out today. And of course, we probably have a lot of folks watching online today because of the weather. So glad that we were able to uh, gather uh, again today. We're in a series uh, called Catch Your Breath. And as we kind of enter the new year, the idea and the thought is that you and I would uh, take a step back and reset and refocus as we uh, pursue 2024. And, and so uh, this is our last week in our 21 days of prayer and fasting. And so uh, I hope that you will uh, jump in if you haven't started. And maybe if you missed a few days that you would get reconnected today, you can find uh, the prayer guide online. Uh, there's a couple of prayer uh, guides. There's one uh, reading uh, plan as well. I encourage you to go to. And of course, the How to Pray video course is online as well, all in hopes to help you uh, kick off uh, the new year and really establish a new goal. And that new goal is that you would press on. That's the idea that we would slow down, catch our breath, and, and that we would press on towards the most important goal that we see in Scripture. Paul says in verse thir- uh, 14, of Philippians chapter three, he says, I press on towards the goal, the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And so the goal, the prize is knowing Jesus, right? The upward call is not only knowing Jesus, but becoming more like Jesus. It's embracing our calling. It's, it's stepping into our purpose. And, and as we step into our purpose, as we step into this calling, we are pursuing, yes, the greatest goal that you and I would ever seek to accomplish in our life. This goal is really grounded in spreading the gospel and making disciples, using your gifts, using your talents, using the resources that God has given to you and connecting in the the church that God would lead you to serve in, which is FC. And as we pursue that together, we are pursuing knowing Jesus more and more every day, becoming more and more like him. And so, yeah, this is a good time to set some goals. But the problem with setting goals um, in the new year is oftentimes uh, there's a a large majority of you that don't set any goals, right? So there's a a large percentage of us today that just aren't gonna set any goals. And, And then those of you that do, I mean, yes, you want to change. There's a desire for change. There's a There's an encouragement for you to pursue something, to get better, uh, uh, to seek that goal. But even though we want to pursue a goal, so often we actually fail uh, to accomplish it. Why is that? Why do we fail? Why do we not actually reach the goals that that we say we want, that we know we need, that that, maybe every year we're, we're like, we need more of this. And of course, as a follower of Jesus, you're gonna agree with Paul in Philippians 3 that the goal is Jesus. So yeah, I want to become more like him. So, so why do I struggle and, and not uh, accomplish the goal? And I think the reason why a lot of us fail at this is we forget our why. We forget the, the, the why behind why we would accomplish any goal or set out to accomplish any goal. We either forget our why or we don't really know what that why is. And, and sometimes we have the wrong why. Like if you set a goal to exercise or to eat right, the why is because I want to look good. Well, that, that's not a very motivating goal. There's, there's something deeper that must take place in us if we're going to actually pursue a goal and actually accomplish it. And so today I want to help you really discover the why. Why? The, the motivation behind why pursuing Jesus and creating change is so important in the first place, whether it's you know a goal for your business or your personal life or your physical life, but most definitely in your spiritual life, as, as our goal and prize is to become more like Christ, why do we do that? How do we actually accomplish that with, without knowing our why? And my, my thing is, you, you won't. And I don't want you to miss that in 2024. I want you to grasp the why, because when you understand why, you need to make some changes. And, and you actually begin to pursue those changes. Life gets really, really interesting. You get God's attention and and, and growth begins to happen. And so I wanna uh, go to the closing verses of Philippians chapter three. We've been in this chapter for the last few weeks. And I wanna, I wanna go to this and, and realize and learn that yeah, the goal in, in, of life is to become more like Christ, but not only do we prize him, not only is he our goal, but he tells us why this is so important for us. So beginning in verse 17 
of Philippians 3. Let's look at it together. He says, brothers, join me or join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. A uh, few, few things here that I think are incredibly important. The, the motivation behind why we would become more like Christ, the motivation for why we would pursue him, the motivation uh, as to why we need more of him. Why do you need to make changes in your life? Why do you need to make financial changes and physical changes? Why does your diet need to change? Why does your spending habits need to change? Why does, how do you respond and, and, and treat people when you're stressed out need to change? The, the reason behind all of those changes that need to take place in our life is because you and I as followers of Jesus are citizens of heaven. Our new identity as a follower of Christ is that we belong to heaven. Heaven is our future, heaven is our home, and so it's time for us to start acting like heaven. So how do we do that? Well, he gives us a few things that we wanna pull out of this scripture. First in verse 17, he says, follow the right example. And he starts by saying, join in imitating me. Paul is saying, I'm a good example for you to follow. So, so follow my example. Now, if I was gonna hike Mount Everest, which I'm not, but if I were going to, I wouldn't want a guide that had never been to the top. I would want to go with a guide, a group of guides actually, that have been to the top. They've, they've been there, they know how to get there, they've gone through some experiences on you know, the mountain, right? That's who you would want too. You would want experienced good guides to help you go to the top of Everest. If you were climbing and halfway up, you realized that the guy that was leading the team had never been to the top, you'd panic. <laughs> this is not a good thing. I didn't mean to go with you. I want to go with somebody that's been there and that's done this. And, and so Paul is saying, you've got to follow the right example. You, you want to put your attention, you want to put your focus on people who are living a lifestyle of, of dying to self and following Jesus. Paul's saying, follow me. Now, this isn't an arrogant statement because we read last week that he actually said, I'm not perfect. I haven't made it there. I, I'm, I'm, I'm still a work in progress. But he said, one thing I do know, right? I forget the past. I leave the past in, you know, behind me and I press on and I focus towards my future. And so he strains forward to the future prize, which is becoming more like Christ and, and, and having more of him in our life. So Paul is a great example. We can read about his life in the book of Acts. And when you see this, Acts is a, really the, the narrative story of, of how the early church begins. And Paul is a, a big character in the book of Acts. And, and when you read through that book, you see that his life was just filled with struggle. His life was filled with adversity. And so he knows what it's like to live with regret and shame because he's got a pretty sketchy background. We, we know as we read his story that he was disappointed that he went through traumatic experiences in his life. He was uh, on, on a boat. He almost died because it shipwrecked. And he, he was bitten by a snake and almost died. He was beaten and left for dead a, a few different times. And he was thrown into prison because of his faith in God. He, he built his own business. He planted churches. He developed leaders. He is a great model for you and I to follow. He is a good example. And so he's saying, look to me. And when we see the, the, the letters in the New Testament that he wrote to the churches, even though he was going through all of these things in his life, he was showing and writing under, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit how to find God and love God and enjoy God in the midst of suffering and adversity in his life. He was writing about how to find joy in adversity. He was 
writing to us and, 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 and showing us how to have courage to lead and preach the gospel in a, in a hostile world, a, a world that hates God and, and doesn't want anything to do with Jesus. And through all of this, he's saying, this is what it looks like to follow and trust Jesus. He's a good example. But then he also says in verse 17, to keep your eyes on those who walk according to the examples that you have in us. And so he's saying, look to me as an example, but also look around you in the church that God has called you to. You're gonna find men and women, godly men and women in the church that God is calling you to serve to look to them as well. Those who are following Jesus, he's teaching us that we all need good examples. We need role models in our life. We need real people to follow. Now, this is important because with social media, so many of us follow you know, famous Christians or famous athletes who are Christians or pastors who are you know, famous or whatever on social media, and that's all well and good, but you need real life people that you can have conversations with and drink coffee with. You need godly men and women in your life that are real people that know you and, and, and can encourage you in your life. So that means pastors and small group leaders and people in our church that are serving. Like these are the people that he would call you to look to and, and let them set an example for you. That's why God has brought us together as a church. And, and here again, we see it all throughout the New Testament. You hear us talk about it all the time. It's why relationships are one of the keys to growth. For you to become the man that God wants you to be, you're gonna need an older godly man who's been there, who's done that, to look to, to ask questions to, to watch how he interacts with his wife and how he raised his kids and how he manages his work life and, 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 and ministry and, 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 and listen to his regrets and how he's messed up. And you and I need that. That's why relationships are so important. Ladies, same is true for you. What do we do in our culture though? We isolate ourselves. We isolate ourselves and we're afraid to expose our, 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 our weaknesses. We're afraid to ask questions because we don't wanna be embarrassed. Like, you know, men and, 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 and you know, we have this thing, like we can figure it out on our own. I don't need anybody, but you read the New Testament. I mean, right here, it's in front of us. This is why small groups are so important. It's why serving in a church is so important because you're on a team and people are, are interacting with you and you're learning from them as you serve together. This is why coming to church in person is so important. This is why being a part of a church regularly is so important because we need each other. He's saying, follow my example, but also follow the other people in the church that are giving you a good examples. Uh, it's so important why your kids need uh, to look to godly volunteers and and youth pastors and, and people in our student ministry and kids ministry, that they are looking towards that example. These are people that you can know, that your kids can know. Start them young when they're in middle school, get them here on Wednesday night so that they connect with other leaders. And, and we've got such phenomenal leaders. They've, we've got people that have started sixth grade small groups and they've stayed with those kids all the way through their senior year. That, that's happened multiple times. And these are people that love uh, our, 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 our community and our kids. And, and, and so encourage you to put them in those right environments. We know you know, we're sending our kids out to liberal colleges and liberal schools with liberal teachers. And if we're sending them into those environments, people who don't love or know Jesus, don't care about godly morals. I mean, we can't be surprised if we're sending our kids to liberal teachers and they come home liberals. Like we have to wake up. We have to do better. We've got to put them in the right environments to be able to learn and grow from the right role models. This is huge in our life. Who are your role models today? Who are you looking to? Uh, the podcast that you listen to, what, what kids, uh, what your kids are, you know, hanging on their walls, what, what posters are they putting up? What, what musicians are they looking up to? Like, who are your role models today? I think as men, we lose that. As kids, it's usually an athlete, it's a musician, it's somebody famous. We don't know them. They probably aren't living a moral lifestyle. And then as we get older, we kind of lose sight of that. But Paul is telling us that we need role models. This is why we do men's breakfast and we're, we're gonna do women's breakfast in, in, in the coming weeks. Why? To, to help you kind of establish some other friendships, to be around some other, other guys who have been married 20, 30, 40 plus years 
they've got some experience, they've made some mistakes, and it's, it's younger guys leaning into that experience. See, we never get too old to, to, to where we don't need role models. And I, I think that your role models determine what you model. I think what, what you are looking to as a role model is how you're gonna, you're gonna live your life, essentially. It's just how, why relationships in the right environments, you know this. If you're a parent and you have kids, you know this. This is why you want them to hang around the good kids and you don't like this person. Or the, we wanna be in, in this environment because the role models that you have will determine what you model. If you hang out with four drunks, you're gonna be the fifth. <laughs> if you hang out with four losers, it's only a matter of time before you're the fifth. So who we spend time with, who we are around in so many ways is gonna determine our future. As parents, we get this. Uh, we want to be around the right examples. But I think the other side of this is yeah, he's saying imitate me and follow these examples, but I think we also need to be the right example. Let's not miss that point, that we're not just looking to other people to, you know, to show us the way, but at some point you've got to wake up and realize, oh yeah, I'm an example too. If you're a high school student, there are middle schoolers on Wednesday nights looking to you. If you're a 20-year-old uh, in the room, you've got high school students looking up to you and so forth. Like we're all influencing other people. Some of you might say, oh, no, nobody's following me. And I just want to wake you out of that lie. People are watching you. Your wife, your kids, people at work, people are looking at your social media. They're watching you. What type of example are you actually providing for them? We wanna be a good example. We want to recognize that people are watching us. And you also wanna recognize that the people that are watching you, you might be the only Christian in their life. You might be the only role model, you might be the only example that they could actually look to. If you're in college, if you're in high school, like there are kids in your classroom, you literally might be the only Christian that they know. You might be the only example that they will see for years. And so, yeah, there should be a little pressure on us. We should live with that. Why? What's the, what's the why behind why? We should care. You're a citizen of heaven. That's your identity. You, you live for heaven. This is not our home. Don't live for this home. Live for your future home. Your new identity is, 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 is I'm a I'm a citizen of heaven. Heaven is my home. That's where I'm going. So yeah, right now, I wanna live for heaven by being a good example. There's the second, third, third thing I think that we see in this scripture. He calls us to stand firm against the enemies of the cross. So because we're a citizen of heaven, that's the why. That's why we stand firm against enemies of the cross. He says, many of you whom uh, of, of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears. Now, have you ever written somebody a letter or a message and like you get teary-eyed, you're like so emotional and it's so like uh, just, you know, welling up inside of you as you're writing this letter, you're, you're just getting emotional. I know all the men, when you write your Valentine's cards, that's gonna happen to you this month. Like it's coming, you're just gonna, I love you and tears. It's Paul's like emotions. He's, he's writing under, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but he's so emotional because he loves these people. This is a church that he started and planted. He loves the people in the Philippian church. And even with tears, you know, in his eyes, he's writing this. He's saying that some people used to be in the church, but they left the church. They used to follow Jesus, but now they don't anymore. And so that's why he's so upset with tears in his eyes. He, he knows the names, just like you know their names. They used to be here. They, they, they used to sing to, to, to Jesus on Sunday morning. They used to serve, but now they're, they're, they're not here. And he says, now they're walking as enemies of the cross. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and they glory in their shame with mindset on earthly things. Therefore, brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, he says, stand firm. Stand firm, right, against the enemies of the cross. So uh, first of all, he says their end is their destruction. Now, essentially what he is teaching us here is, is that their future is destruction. Like I think the reality, again, why do we wanna be a good example? Why do I wanna follow a good example to become more like Jesus so that I can be an example? I'm a citizen 
of heaven. That's the why. Now my, my, my why is also there are people who are lost. There are people who are walking as enemies of the cross. Knoxville, there are people in Knoxville walking as enemies of the cross. Why do we plan a church? Why do we invest so much money? Why are you sacrificing to set up, tear down in a school? Why are you sacrificing to go to this location? And, and, and needs more renovation, not the greatest you know, space, but, but kind of works right now. Why would you do this? Because there are people walking as enemies of the cross. That's why. And you're a citizen of heaven. And so that's why we would send you. That's why we would invest in you. That's why every Sunday, this is part of, of, of your ministry. And, and week to week to week, this is why you're investing in the city of Knoxville. Their end is their destruction. Without Jesus, hell is their destination. And that's true of everyone listening today. If you have not given your life to Jesus, if you haven't put your faith in Jesus today, destruction is your end. And so these are people that reject Jesus. They don't believe in Jesus. They don't wanna be with Jesus now. So they're not gonna be with Jesus when they die. It is, it's, it's simple, right? The future destruction is hell. Then he begins to talk about what these people do with their life. What, what, what describes their life? Um, he says, B, they, uh, pleasure is their God. Their God is their belly, right? So pleasure is their God. They're not concerned about eternity. They're not concerned about pleasing God. They're not concerned about honoring God. They're just simply concerned about pleasure, coping with their feelings in the moment, right here, right now. How can I make myself feel better about what I'm feeling, right? And so is that food? Is that sex? Is that money? Whatever it is that makes me feel good, I'm gonna overindulge in that particular item because it makes me feel better. Their pleasure is their God. And because pleasure is their God, they don't care about God's plan. They don't care about what God says is gonna bring them happiness in marriage. So that's why sex before marriage is not an issue for them. They're gonna run after pleasure because they don't believe God's plan is better. You know, they're gonna find their identity in money and they're gonna chase after money and they're gonna try to build their kingdom here on earth. And, and they're gonna spend a lot of time investing in themselves and spending all of their money on themselves. Why? Because pleasure is their God. They're not looking towards eternity, right? Pleasure is their God. Their God is their belly. Next, he says they glory in their shame. They glory in their shame. So that just simply means that they're arrogant about sin. They're so arrogant about their sin that they don't even try to hide it. They wanna flaunt it. They're, they're, they're proud of their sin. They're proud of, of, of how they mock God. They're proud of how they chase after their own pleasure. They're not ashamed of it. They glory in their shame. They glory in their sin. They laugh about how wasted they got. They laugh about how many women they slept with, right? Paul says they're proud of their sin. They don't even try to hide it. These are people who are arrogant about sin. We, we, we look to these people, by the way. Did you know that? We've got to be so careful because we, we look to these people who are arrogant about their sin. We, we care about their opinion. We follow them on social media. We look to them for relational advice. And I think the warning is that make sure you're following the right examples here. And there was a movie that was just released called The Book of Clarence. You seen this? Uh, rapper Jay-Z was the producer of this movie, and it's basically an entire mockery of Jesus. This coming from a man who in one of his own songs says, Jesus can't save you, life starts when the church ends. And yet how many of us, you know, have his album or download his music or like this is a man who is arrogant and proud of his sin and, and, and of his stance, mocking the life of Jesus. Thankfully, it's a total um, bomb at the box office. Like nobody wants to see that junk. <laughs> Don't go see it. Don't waste your money on that type of mockery of the life of Jesus. But we've got to be mindful. Some of us just don't think. We just live like everybody else around us. And we've got to follow the right examples. We don't want to walk as enemies of the cross and walk with enemies of the cross. We want to, we want to walk 
differently. Here's the next thing. Not only do they glory in their shame, but their minds are set on earthly things. And so they're focused on material things. They live as if this is the only life. When you live as if this is the only life, you're worried about tomorrow, you spend all of your money on yourself. Why would you give or invest your money into eternity or heaven or into making disciples? Why would you do that? Well, I gotta spend all of my money on me because life is all about this moment. And so we live paycheck to paycheck and run up credit card debts. Why? Because we are living for earthly things. Our mind is on material things. We don't act like grownups and walk with Christ and say no to ourselves, no to the new item and no to that car payment and no to this and, 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 and say no to ourself so that we can properly invest in our future home. So many are focused on the material. You might say, Trent, I believe in Jesus. You know I do, but I struggle. I'm struggling. I look at this list and I'm struggling with this list and I don't wanna walk as an enemy of, <laughs> of the cross, but some of you are struggling to embrace your citizenship in heaven. You're struggling by focusing on material things. You're following the wrong examples. Sometimes you might even laugh at sin, laugh at your own sin. You might even be arrogant about your sin. I don't want pleasure to be my God, you might say, but, but your desires and the temptation is so strong that perhaps you might even be walking as an enemy of the cross. If that's you, you've got to confess and repent and turn away from that and tell tell the Lord today, just say, God, I am sorry, I confess, I mess up, I am failing. But then you say, thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for making me a citizen of heaven. Thank you for giving me the Holy Spirit to live according to your word. I'm gonna walk in victory tomorrow. I'm gonna walk in victory tonight, right? That's not who I am. That's, that's what it looks like to walk with Jesus and to become more like him. It's the confessing and then it's the embracing of who you really are. And you tell him that every, every day, every step, every step of your life as you struggle through the old man that wants to take over again. You died to self, but that old man, that old woman, she or he keeps creeping into your life and tempting you to, to, to live as an enemy of the cross. And it's like embracing that identity. No, 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 that's not how citizens of heaven act or walk or talk. And so I'm not, I'm not embracing that. Forgive me, Jesus. Thank you for that forgiveness. And thank you for the Holy Spirit that you've given me to walk in freedom. They focus on material things. But here's the final word. This is the why. He tells us to focus on heaven. You know, forget the past. Don't live in the past. Focus on on heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior. We're waiting on Jesus to return, by the way. We're waiting on Jesus to return. And, 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 and so as we wait on him, we're called to act like heaven. We're called to live for heaven. We're called to become more and more like Christ. This is the why behind the changes you need to make in your life. The why behind why you need to follow the right examples. The why behind why you need to be a good example. The why behind why Jesus needs to be your goal and becoming more like him needs to be your goal. Why? Because this is who he created you to be. The upward call is to live for heaven, to think about eternity. Jesus is coming again one day. You and I will leave this world and we will be in heaven for eternity. And what we do today matters. What we do and how we invest in our future home matters. We'll be rewarded in the future based on how we live and give today. You've got to stand firm, he says. You've got to stand firm, young people at school, because everybody in your class is going to walk as an enemy of Christ, and you're going to, you know, you, you, you're going to look different. You're going to act different. And, and you might say, well, I don't want to look or act different because those are the ones that get made fun of. Well, guess what? Like you're a citizen of heaven. You, you should look different and act different. 
Same for you, sir. When you walk into the office, when you walk into your job, you should be treating people differently. They should hear different language coming out of you. They should see somebody who's working hard even when the boss isn't looking. And when you're working from home because of snow, you're actually doing your job and not just being lazy. Why? Because I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm not serving a boss, I'm serving the Lord. I'm not working for him or her. I'm, I'm working as, a, as if I am working for the Lord. And so if heaven is our home, it means that we need to dress like heaven. Don't dress like an enemy of the cross. It means that we should talk like heaven. Don't talk like an enemy of the cross. It means we act like heaven. We don't act like an enemy of the cross. You engage in the pleasures of heaven. You don't engage in the pleasures of this world. Right? So we focus on where we're going, not where we've been. Hear that again. <clears throat> we focus on where we're going, not where we've been. I get it. You don't want to go back to 2023, maybe a rough year, maybe a difficult season of life for you. You don't want to go back to it. That's great. <clears throat> Put it in the past. Let it stay there. Let's focus on where we're going. Let's focus on eternity. Let's start living for our home. There's a, there's a sport called tree skiing. Um, if you've ever heard of this, but th this is where skiers will come down the mountain, not on the trail, but like through the woods, like through a forest. And so they're like, the, the point is like not to hit you know, the tree, this is kind of like an extreme sport. They get a rush from this. Probably sounds like, you know, a death wish for most of us. Uh, but this is kind of what they want. They, and so there was a, uh, an article in Outside Magazine, and, and uh, one of the professional skiers that does this, they were interviewing him named Tim Etchells, and he said the most challenging uh, type of skiing is, is through, skiing through the woods, which I would agree with, even though I've not done it. And he said, what you focus your eyes on become critical in the woods. You've got to look to the spaces in between the trees, the exits where you hope to be traveling. He said, don't stare at what you don't want to hit. That makes sense. Look to the spaces, the gaps. I think the problem with a lot of Christians is that they get focused on the trees and they wonder why they get hurt. You're focused on the trees of, of, of the sin and temptation in your life in, in, in a worldly outlook. And instead of focusing on where you're going, heaven, you get distracted by the trees around you. You let pleasure become more important than holiness and you hit the tree. You let greed become more important than generosity and you hit the tree. You've got to get your focus off of the worldly things and you've got to get your mind on where you want to go, your final destination. So live for heaven, live for eternity, live for the things that will last forever. Right? And all of the things that we are living for, so often we have to realize moth, rust, destroy. That's what Jesus says. So invest in eternity. eternity. We spend so much time, I think, some of us walking and living and being around enemies of the cross. And as a result, we're not influencing them. They are influencing us. We've got to get our mind off the trees. We've, we, we've got to get our minds on the future that God has for us. Your role models determine what you model. You might ask, why do I need to become more like Christ? Why do I need to eat better, talk better, dress better? Why does how I speak matter? Right? It's not looking good or feeling good or just earning a bunch of blessings. The why is because you act like an enemy of the cross, which brings into your life bad examples. You are end up being a bad example. You end up creating sin in your life that ruins your future. Christ would call us to walk as a citizen of heaven, Right? You're never gonna feel right. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're never gonna feel right acting like an enemy of the cross. There should be that tension even in your heart today. Paul is writing to the church in Philippi. Now, Rome is here and 5,000 miles away is Philippi. 
So like, pretend this is a map. <laughs> like five, that's a long trip, 5,000 miles. But at the time, Rome had conquered Macedonia where Philippi was. And so what's interesting is that Philippi was a Roman colony and its citizens, even though they lived in Macedonia, they were considered citizens of Rome. And so the citizens of Roman colonies lived as the Romans did. They dressed like Romans. They worshiped the gods of Rome. They followed Roman law, right? They did and, and incorporated all the social affairs of citizens of Rome. Even though they lived in Macedonia, their citizenship was in Rome. And so the point is that the Philippian church members, they understood what it meant to live in one place, but be a citizen of another place. They understood what it meant to live on earth, but be citizens of heaven. I think we struggle with this. I think we live in America and sometimes our American citizenship takes precedence over our heavenly citizenship. And we have to be very cautious because that is a fundamental switch in how we live our life. It's very important. Right? We live and must live as if heaven comes first. Heaven comes first. Heaven comes before the Constitution. Heaven comes before our politics. Heaven comes before any of our personal goals. The loyalty and focus that we have needs to be grounded in our citizenship in heaven because that is our home. That's where we're going. And if we follow Jesus, that's where we're going. So we've got to live for eternity. I'm convinced that if you embrace your identity as a citizen of heaven, it's going to help you remember your why and why you should look different in this world. It's why you should be giving financially to Foothills Church. It's why you should be serving. It's why you should be building relationships here. It's why you should be helping make disciples here. Why? Because this is who you are. This is what Christ is calling us. This is the upward call. Think about it like this. Some of you are Tennessee Volunteer fans. And yesterday, the Tennessee men's basketball team uh, really put a beat down on the Alabama basketball team. And I mean, it was like 20 points. It was like a bloodbath. It was humiliating, I guess, if you're an Alabama fan. But um, I know, I know, you, you won in football. And so, but Satan left. I mean, Saban left. And so now all of Alabama is, is, is crying and, and Tennessee won, right? If you're a Tennessee fan, you're going to buy Tennessee apparel, right? You're going you're gonna to buy the orange and white. You're going to invest in Tennessee. You're going to buy tickets, go to the games. You're going to buy, you know, $12 Cokes. <laughs> you're going to maybe even buy season tickets. Why? You're a Tennessee fan. You're gonna invest in Tennessee. Now, if you were born and raised in Tennessee and you're a Tennessee fan, you are not going to, to wear crimson tide maroon. You're not gonna buy Alabama gear, are you? That's ridiculous. <clears throat> you're not gonna do that. Why? Because Tennessee's your home. You're gonna invest in your home. Why do so many Christians neglect investing into their own home? Why do we neglect investing in our future home? Some of you are terrible planners, I get it. And so your personality is like, I don't even know what I'm doing tonight, Trent. Like I can't plan my way out of the bathroom, hardly. Like your mind, your ADD or whatever, you don't plan. Some of you plan your vacation, you know, 12 months in advance. You know what time you're waking up and what adventure you're going on and you've already bought the tickets and you bought everything and you're the one that keeps everybody in line. And so when I talk about this, your brain kind of goes to, okay, yeah, I need to start planning for my future home in heaven. And so I spend differently, I act differently, my time is spent differently. You start to make the connection, but then you have to go home and you live with the person that is opposite of you. And so you're gonna go home and argue about how you spend money and you're gonna argue about how you spend your time. Well, we don't need to do that, we need to do this. And right, that's the tension, right? And so if you're the planner or you're not the planner, what you have to recognize is like, this is, this is what maturity in Christ looks like. It's sitting down and saying, we're supposed to walk differently. When you look at our life, we, we might be walking more like an enemy of the cross instead of walking like a follower of Jesus. And we need to make an adjustment in how we spend our time 
in how we use our finances because heaven must come first. Uh, Billy Graham tells a story of a time when Albert Einstein was uh, going on a train uh, out of uh, town to a, a different engagement. He was traveling so much and speaking at different um, organizations and places, places at that time. And at, the, at that time, the conductor would walk by and take your ticket and then they would you know, punch the ticket. And so the conductor came to um, Dr. Einstein and, and uh, he looked in his pocket and couldn't find his ticket. And the conductor said, oh, that's okay. I know who you are, Dr. Einstein. I, I get it. I'm sure you bought a ticket. And so, you know, I, I, I trust you. And he went on and started taking everybody else's ticket and, and uh, you know, punching the hole in that and, and moving forward. But before he went to the next car, he turned around and he saw Dr. Einstein on his hands and knees looking under his seat. He's looking under his seat. He's trying to find his ticket. And so the conductor goes back to him and he says, look, Dr. Einstein, really, I know who you are. Uh, you, you really don't need to find the ticket, okay? Uh, you, can, you can trust me, you're okay. And Dr. Einstein looked up and said, I too know who I am. What I don't know is where I'm going. <laughs> he, he needed his ticket because he didn't know which stop he needed to get off of. You know, a lot of times Christians live their life like that. If you don't know where you're going, you can live a very distracted life you can live a life that never feels right. If you don't know where you're going, then you're not gonna have confidence to enjoy the journey that God has put you on. But there is a steadiness, there is a maturity in knowing that your home is heaven, your future is, is with Jesus, and that is the motivation, the why, for why we would run after the prize, the goal of not only knowing Jesus, but becoming like Jesus. Some of you don't know where you're going. And I hope today was an encouragement that as a Christian, you're a citizen of heaven. That's your future home. And so start investing in your future home. Start living for your future home. Start acting like heaven. Maybe you need to get the right example. Maybe you need to be the right example. Maybe you need to do better at standing strong against the enemies of the cross. And all of us need to focus on heaven more because that's our motivation. And I pray that you would be encouraged today. And I pray that some of you who maybe not not living for Christ today would give your life to him today. You read the list of enemies of the cross and it's like, check, 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 check. And in your heart, it's like, man, I don't know that heaven is my home. And I just wonder if today, folks in Knoxville, people here, maybe even watching online, if, if you've never given your life to Jesus, heaven isn't your home. You know, you could change that today. You could make heaven your home today by confessing your sin and putting your faith in Jesus today. What he did on the cross pays for your sin. By admitting your sin, by receiving him into your life, his forgiveness, which is a free gift, you can commit your life to him, walk with him, let heaven be your home and let him change your life today. Let me just ask you to bow your heads as we close today. And I wonder if anybody would, would just say, yeah, that's me today, Trent. I, if I were to be completely honest with you, my life is really a life that is walking as an enemy of, cro uh, of the cross. Like I'm just, I'm just living my life for me. I'm not living for Jesus. I haven't put my faith in Jesus. And for me, I, I think that's gotta be my first step. And if that's you, just, just, Make this statement your statement. This prayer isn't a magical prayer or anything. It's just like a way for you to articulate your heart to God. He's convicting you of your sin. You know you need to change. You know you need Him. So just simply say, God, I confess that I'm a sinner. I confess that I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. I commit my life to you from this point forward. I receive you by faith. I believe you rose from the grave. And now I ask you to come into my life. From this day forward, I will walk with Jesus. Thank you for making heaven my home. 
I wonder in the stillness and quietness of this room and in Knoxville today, if someone has prayed that prayer, would you just be so bold as to just lift up your hand today and just say, I just prayed, Trent. I just gave my life to Jesus. Anybody at all here in Maryville? Pastor Taylor looking. I see you, young lady. Praise God. Anybody else? I didn't see. Raise it back up. That was you. Anybody else? Sir, I see you all the way up to the top. Pastor Taylor, there's probably some in Knoxville as well. I want to encourage you today, if that is you, go to our care and prayer room. Let them know. And Pastor Trent led on that prayer. I gave my life to Jesus on this snowy, wintry, cold day in January. I am no longer an enemy of the cross. Church here in Maryville, Knoxville, can we give a round of applause for those that made that decision today? <clears throat> Let me pray and and we will sing a song together to thank God for what he's done. Lord, we praise you and love you. God, thank you for the truth of, of the scripture. Thank you for the example that Paul has given to us to follow. Lord, thank you for giving the men and women of Foothills Church to us to, to follow their example. Some great mentors and small group leaders and godly people that have followed you and served you for many, many years, Lord. Thank you for their influence on my life and on the lives of all the people of our church. Lord, may you continue to inspire us and grow us as citizens of heaven, that we might act like heaven. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing. Thank you so much for watching this video. We'd love for you to like this video and leave a comment. We'd also like to encourage you to subscribe and click the bell so you never miss an upload from Foothills Church. To learn more about FC, you can go to our website, foothillschurch.com, or by clicking the link in the description below.